how do you address the challenges that that Canadian cinema has to Eight? break through to uh, break through into into the American market? You know, look at there's there's a disproportionate amount of I think movie stars or at least huge comedy stars that come out of Canada. Um, they're great Canadian filmmakers. Um, you know. I mean, there is this stigma, like uh, people, I, I won't lie, people will say, you know, that film feels Canadian or it's too Canadian or something. Um, they say that about American films? <laughs> sometimes, yeah. Uh, no, but, you know, I mean, we will, like, we had a film, uh, you know, we have films, Canadian films, and they'll want to play it at Toronto opening night. They want to play it in Perspectives Canada. We'll say, no, we actually have to not get it be ghettoized as a Canadian film. You know, I don't know. I mean, ultimately, I'd like to think films stand on their own merit. And obviously, there are a lot of Canadian films that have worked in the U.S. And you know, you've got world-class filmmakers like Adam McGowan. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I, you know, to me, it's hard to look at the challenge from south of the border because this is a subsidy culture up here. And if you're ordained, it's a lot easier. The perception is it's a lot easier to get your films made. Uh, than it is in the U.S., although the U.S. has become a subsidy culture. You know, before, I mean, 10, ten years ago, there were no uh, state subsidies, you know, and, and a lot of those subsidies were created as a result of runaway production to Toronto and Vancouver. Um, and so now it, and now you can't really get a film made in the U.S. unless you count that, you know, 15 to 25 percent you get from the tax subsidies mm -hmm. in the, of the various states. Um, and I realize that that doesn't extend to distribution, but um, you know I don't know. I think uh, sometimes maybe Canadian films are well served not to play Toronto or something, you know, to play at Sundance or to play other festivals. Um, but it's very, you know, there's no real panacea. There's no easy answer. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's sort of a case by case scenario. But it is it is a real concern that the, if you if you get a, distri a U.S. distributor on an honest day, they're they're wary of films that they consider too Canadian. I'm in the service business. You know, you either make films or you help people make films. And yes, there is a, you know, there's a sort of strict uh, traditional uh, conception of what a lawyer does. But really, what lawyers do is not so different on, uh, on a continuum from what people who go put financing together do. You know, it may be more technical. It may be further down the line. But what we have a service company, we have a series of service companies, and we help films get made and out into the world, and for people to sort of understand the different things we do, we, we define them differently, and we put them in different silos, but really it's just a continuum of, of, a, of a single function, which is to serve people in making movies, and use our relationships and use our expertise in the service of getting that done. But the industry in the last 20 years has sort of moved in our direction in almost every respect. I mean, financing, studios used to finance their movies. Now they don't finance their movies at all. They finance their movies the way the independents have always financed their movies. They may, they may add a couple zeros to it, but it's really the same process. Um, a lot of the movies that used to be released by studios are now made outside the studios, you know, these sort of uh, high-end, I would call high-end specialty films, you know, the sort of movie star driven um, character pieces that, that aren't the blockbusters. You know, the studios are now really reserving their focus to the blockbusters and putting the other films out for, you know, to be put together and financed and to a large extent released however they happen to be released. So uh, my feeling is the industry has sort of moved toward our skill set and toward um, even, you know, there's a much larger percentage of the films that are made and out into the world that that are outside the studio system now and sort of done our way from our mentality. My ambition for it, uh, no small ambition, was to be the sort of ASCAP BMI of, of the audiovisual, the digital audiovisual space. And that was born of the idea that we were seeing 1,200 films a year. And in the sort of analog uh, 20th century, we would and still, even we would we would represent say fifty a year for for all rights sales, and the eleven hundred and fifty we would just say, well, these do not have enough of an audience to sort of get an all rights distribution deal. But you know, with 
with the creation of iTunes and Amazon and, and, and all these digital portals, the promise of, of every film finding an audience, you know, or a number of audiences was, was sort of created. And I think we're just really at the dawn of the digital era of, of the sort of nichification of films where maybe they won't generate a lot of money, but that every film will have a, a, a sort of long, long tail value. And so we created this company whose job it is to basically disperse these films, optimize them, you know, in broadband, and um, and I guess to a certain extent give hope to people who were in those 1,150 films who who went ahead and made their film and who were sort of faced with the prospect that there would be no way for people to consume them. But we have all the cable operators and uh, and we have direct deals with them. So we have cable VOD and all of the broadband portals. And, the, and there's going to be, I mean, the, the immediate future, I'd say for the next five years, the real opportunity on broadband, um, and I think beyond, is going to be in subscription VOD, you know, which is basically Netflix. There are going to be a lot of Netflix imitators that are coming online. Um, and a lot of films, if you have films, for instance, that you've produced that haven't really been optimized in the marketplace, I think you'll have the opportunity to go to an aggregator like like FilmBuff and put them in packages that can then, on a non-exclusive basis, be be cycled through all the different subscription services and be monetized. You know, to what extent remains to be seen. It's not going to be a huge amount of money, but it is going to be money. Filmmakers love to see their films in theaters, but it's really expensive to release film. Um, and I always have these arguments with critics. I have this argument with Owen Gleiberman from Entertainment Weekly all the time. It's like the studios are interested in basically marginalizing critics so that they can't, you know, they can't um, kill their movies. And yet critics feel compelled to review films that are review-proof. And smaller films, often they won't review. And so what I say to, them, what I say to Owen is like, why do you limit the films you review to films that are theatrically released? Why don't you review films that are interesting films or worthy of criticism, whether they premiere on, on VOD or whether they premiere theatrically? And he says, I agree with you. My, my editors won't allow me to do it. So, so hopefully in this sort of perfect future, or at least better future, um, you won't have to spend the money for a theatrical release to get literary movies, you know, seen out into the world. Eddie Burns, you guys know who he is. We had, we had Fitzgerald Family Christmas was a film we played at Toronto this year. But Eddie, Eddie's, um, you know, he's, he makes these small movies. And I said to him about five years ago, I said, you know, you're spending all of your profits trying to do these films theatrically. You're the kind of guy who could get booked on Jimmy Fallon or something. Why don't we take this film that you made for almost no money, let's put it on cable VOD, you go on um, Fallon, and, and we won't release it theatrically. You go on Fallon and say, and talk about your new film, and you say, on the show, um, when I'm done with this, with my appearance here, you can push two buttons on your cable remote and watch my movie. And that is a film that can be seen, you know, simultaneously by 300 million people, as opposed to a film that gets bicycled around in platform release theatrically. And, you know, he, exponentially more of his fans can now see his films because of that. Now, not every filmmaker has the ability to get booked on Jimmy Fallon, and you gotta, that's where the problem comes, where you have to get these reviews and do a theatrical release to even create some awareness about your movie. Hopefully in the future that won't happen, where you can sort of niche market directly to your audience through social media. So when you're, when you're negotiating and securing a price, I mean, what goes on there? I mean, you're, you're looking out for the interest of the creative parties and the producers because I mean it can go like up and down how do you figure out it's like I mean are I you mean, trying it, to get the most for the film it's or? a it's a calculus I mean I often take deals that are not the most for instance we sold a film out of Sundance called Before Midnight which hopefully you will all go see because it's a great movie it is the third in the series of Before Sunrise and Before Sunset and we sold it. We sold it to Sony Pictures Classics, who I've had my contretemps with over the years. Um, and, and we had six offers for more money than they were offering. But we knew that this was a jewel, and we knew that they could really bring it to its public uh, in a more uh, 
assured way than anyone else, and they could get it nominated. They they could put it, position it to get nominated, and they also they have they have a they have a pay TV deal, uh, which is tied to box office performance, which is better than anyone else who was offering. And so we did a model of of the back end versus just what the advance would be, and we thought it, that in we found out that in success we would make more money from Sony than we would from the other six people who were offering, and so. You know, it's about who has the right marketing take on it. It's about who has a slot, you know, who doesn't have too many films. There, there's so many different things that go into the calculus of, of figuring out what the right deal is for the right buyer. That it's, it's, I mean, there are people who will just auction films to the highest bidder, but we really pride ourselves in not necessarily just doing that. Well, I mean, how, how did you, I mean, Napoleon Dynamite. How did you f discover that? Napoleon, Napoleon Dynamite came over the transom, and it was the it was the first film in the entire history of our company that every single person who worked there voted in favor of. It was unanimous, and um, and our idea for selling that movie is that that's the kind of movie that had to be a discovery because, you know, one of the things, uh, one of these sort of axiomatic things that we do is. We try to create the lowest expectations possible while getting everyone in the room, um, because you know a classic example is a film. I don't know if it happened here or was it Sundance. Donnie Darko is a perfect example. Yeah, it was Sundance yeah. of a film that was so overhyped that people wanted to hate it by the time they went into it, and it took years almost to rehabilitate it yeah. for the film it was. Um, so the point Dynamite, we basically kept under the radar. We didn't tell anyone about it. We didn't. Um, we put it on our slate, but when people asked about it, buyers asked about it, we said, yeah, it's this little movie, because we thought it could really blow up. Uh, and sure enough, at the first screening at Sundance, people just went berserk, and they all felt they had discovered it, and that was, then we're doing our job if we do that. You know.